We have previously discussed the ideas of an even function and an odd function, and we want to talk about it a little bit more here and discuss the even and odd identities, or also called the negative angle identities. A function is even if evaluating the function at a negative value and at a positive value gives you exactly the same result. So for example, if we were evaluating cosine of negative pi over 6, if it's an even function, this should be equal to cosine of positive pi over 6. So positive pi over 6, that cosine value would be right here. That would be positive square root of 3 over 2. And negative pi over 6 would actually be coterminal with 11 pi over 6. And that x value is also square root of 3 over 2. So when we talk about our even identities, we're talking about cosine and secant. These are both even functions, and cosine of a negative angle will be equal to cosine of a positive angle. Secant of a negative angle will be equal to secant of the same positive angle. The odd functions would be sine, tangent, cosecant, and cotangent. And when we're talking about an odd function, we mean that if we evaluate the function at a negative angle and at a positive angle, their outputs would have exactly opposite signs. So for example, if we evaluate sine of negative pi over 6, and of course that would be right here, we just talked about that, that would be negative 1 half. This would be equivalent to minus, or the opposite sign there, of sine of positive pi over 6. So when we look up here at positive pi over 6, that's a positive 1 half. So their outputs have opposite signs, and we can make them equivalent by putting a negative in front of that positive angle. So negative 1 half equals to negative 1 half. So we're talking about odd functions. We're basically saying that the negative on the inside is equivalent to having a negative on the outside. So for example, if we knew that tangent theta was equal to 2.6, and we were asked to find tangent of negative theta, using our definition of an odd function, tangent of negative theta would be equal to minus tangent of positive theta. So the negative on the inside can come to the outside. Well, we already know that negative tangent of theta, well we already know tangent theta is equal to 2.6. So let's substitute tangent theta with 2.6. So now we would say that tangent of negative theta would be equal to negative 2.6. So the outputs would be the same numbers but opposite signs if the angles on the inside are same values but opposite signs. Cosine is an even function, so cosine of negative 2 pi over 3 would be equal to exactly the same thing as cosine of positive 2.3. So if we know that cosine of positive 2.3 is a negative 1 half, then we know that cosine of negative 2 pi over 3 would also be equal to negative 1 half. Sine of negative 2 pi over 3 since sine is an odd function, this would be equivalent to negative or the opposite sine of sine of the positive angle. So if I put positive 2 pi over 3 on the inside, sine of 2 pi over 3 would be equal to square root of 3 divided by 2. And we'll bring our negative out. So sine of negative 2 pi over 3 would be equal to negative square root of 3 divided by 2. Now we want to discuss the idea of multiplying trig functions. So here I have cosine theta. And on the inside of the parentheses, we have three terms. We have cosine theta, minus sine theta, and plus 2. So we're going to do what we would have done in algebra. We're going to distribute or multiply the cosine theta function times each of the three terms that are on the inside. 
So we will distribute. When we multiply these functions together, we will write it as cosine theta times cosine theta. It's important to remember here that we are not multiplying the thetas together. And it's also important to remember that a trig function is never separated from its input or its argument. So it's always cosine of an angle. So we have cosine of an angle times cosine of an angle, and that gives us cosine squared of that same angle. And then we're going to distribute minus, so cosine theta times negative sine theta would be minus cosine theta times sine theta. And there's not another way to write that. So we're just going to write it as cosine theta times sine theta. And then cosine theta times a positive 2. That gives us 2 times cosine theta, which we're going to write as plus 2 cosine theta. So it's very much like algebra, except we want to be careful as we pay attention to how we actually treat those trig functions and their inputs. In the next example, we are multiplying two binomials together. In other words, we have within the first parentheses we have two terms, and in the second parentheses we also have two terms. When we multiply two terms times another two terms, we use FOIL. So first times the first will give us 6 sine squared theta. Outer times the outer will give us plus 8 sine theta. Inner times the inner will be minus 3 cosine theta times sine theta. And last times the last, negative times the positive, we get negative 4 times cosine theta. Notice that we don't have any like terms. When we talk about combining like terms, we need everything past the number to be identical, and none of these terms have an identical matching portion following the numbers. So this would be our final answer. Nothing else can be combined once we do the multiplication. If we have 2 sine theta minus 1 squared, so everything here in the parentheses squared, they have two terms inside of the parentheses squared. We will write this out twice. When, it, when we square something, that means to multiply it times itself. So we will write this out twice and then FOIL. So first times the first gives 4 sine squared theta. Outer times the outer, we get minus 2 sine theta. Inner times the inner is another minus 2 times sine theta. And then last times last, negative 1 times negative 1 gives a positive 1. Now we want to see if we can combine any like terms. So we look past the numbers for each of our terms. And we want to know if we have any matching portions. Well, the two middle terms have exactly the same matching portions that follow the numbers. So we can actually combine those like terms. So 4 sine squared theta won't combine with anything else. But minus 2 sine theta and minus 2 sine theta, we combine the numbers in front and keep exactly the same matching portion. So minus 4 sine theta, and then we bring down our constant plus 1. So our like terms are combined exactly the same way they are when we are in algebra. If you think back to your algebra days, when we had two binomials multiplied together, so here we have two terms in parentheses times another two terms in a set of parentheses, if you look at these two terms and two terms, you notice they're exactly the same. They look like two binomials that are exactly the same, except they have opposite signs in between. We will call these conjugates. And something special happens when I multiply two terms times two terms when they have that relationship of being conjugates. First times the first, so we're going to FOIL. We get tangent squared theta, outer times the outer plus tangent theta times secant theta, 
inner times the inner, we get minus secant theta times tangent theta, and then minus, last times the last, we get minus secant squared theta. Now we want to combine like terms, and we look past the numbers, and of course all of these are implied ones for the numbers out front. When we look past the numbers to see if we can combine any like terms, we see that the middle two terms both have tangent theta times secant theta. And so these are like terms and we can combine them. And we combine the numbers out front. Well, plus one minus one gives us zero. So these two middle terms end up canceling each other out. So we end up with tangent squared theta minus secant squared theta. And another word for this, we could call this a difference of two squares. Perfect square minus a perfect square. Now we want to look at doing the opposite of multiplication, and that would be factoring. When we factor, the first thing that we do is we look at all of the terms that we have, and we divide out or we factor out a common factor. So we want to look for what they have in common. And we notice that sine alpha and sine alpha is common to both terms. And it's important that not only the trig function have the same name, but the also, also the input must also be the same. So we must have an alpha and an alpha in order for us to say that we have a common factor of sine alpha. So the input is also important. It must also match. So both of these terms have a common factor of sine alpha. So we'll divide out or factor out to the front that GCF of sine alpha. And on the inside, we would have left cosine alpha minus secant alpha. If we wish to factor sine squared theta minus 1, we have two separate terms, and both of these would be what we call perfect squares. So we're going to think back to algebra when we factor something called a difference of squares. And when we're factoring, let's think about, back to algebra, think about back to this example here, x squared minus 1. When we factor that, we factor that as conjugates. So it's the first term, whatever I'd have to multiply times itself to get x squared, which would be x and x. Basically thinking about the square root of x squared, and the square root of 1 would also be 1, and we put opposite signs in between. So difference of squares always factors as what we would call conjugates. So if I'm factoring sine squared theta minus 1, we will also factor this in a very similar way. But instead of putting x, what we're going to put in the front of both would be sine theta. Sine theta times sine theta gets me back to sine squared theta. We will have opposite signs in between, and then we have that 1 for the last two parts of our parentheses. Now we want to factor 4 times tangent squared beta plus tangent beta minus 3. Once again, I would encourage you to think back to your days of algebra. And every time that you see a trig function, you can start to think about that as being sort of like x in algebra. So we can say that this is similar to the idea of factoring 4. And instead of thinking of it as tangent squared beta, let's think of it as x squared. So that's like x being squared and plus tangent beta, let's think about that as x, minus 3. If you were to factor that in algebra, what would it look like? Well, that would be 4x and x. The signs would have to be opposite. So let's say minus and plus, and then we would have 3 and positive 1. And let's check it to make sure that this gives us back what we want. First times the first gives us 4x squared. Outer times the outer gives us a positive 4x. Inner times the inner a negative 3x. And then last times the last, a minus 3. So when we combine the two middle terms, we get positive x. So that's how we would factor that in algebra.
Now what does it look like in trigonometry? Very, very similar. We're still setting up our two parentheses for those three terms. And instead of having 4x, we're going to have 4 times tangent of that angle beta times tangent beta plus and minus, so we have minus 3, and then we'll have plus 1. So wherever we had x before, now we're just using tangent beta. And of course, we can always check that. So let's check. First times the first gives 4 tangent squared theta. Outer times the outer gives positive 4 tangent beta. Inner times the inner is minus 3 tangent beta, last times the last, and negative 3. And we see that the two middle terms would combine to give me positive tangent beta, which is exactly what we started with. If we want to factor cosine to the fourth x plus 2 cosine squared x plus 1, we're going to think back once again to algebra. So we're going to think about what this is similar to. If we were to factor, so we're going to take cosine raised to the fourth power of x, and we're going to represent that as, let's say, like y. So let's say y to the fourth plus 2 times, and this is cosine squared x, so let's think about that as a variable squared, so y squared plus 1. If we were going to factor that, we would use the same process. We would use reverse FOIL. We have y squared and y squared, and both signs are plus, and we would have to put a 1 in the back of both. And of course, we can check this to make sure that it really does give us what we want. But this is how we would factor in algebra. Now, how are we going to factor in trig? We're still setting up our two parentheses for those three terms. But instead of putting in x, we will now put in cosine squared x cosine squared x, very similar to how we did y squared and y squared, plus 1 and plus 1. And let's check that on the trig version here to make sure that if I multiply these back together, cosine times cosine squared times cosine squared would be cosine to the fourth x. Outer times the outer would be plus cosine squared x. Inner times the inner would be plus cosine squared x. And then last times the last would be plus 1. Our two middle terms would be like terms, so we can combine those to get 2 cosine squared x plus 1. So this checks out, so our final answer here for the factorization of that trinomial would be cosine squared x plus 1 times cosine squared x plus 1. Now we wish to factor sine raised to the fourth power of x minus tangent raised to the fourth power of x. If we think back to algebra, this would be similar to, and we're going to replace, let's think about thinking of sine as a variable like x to the fourth, and tangent as a different variable, let's say y to the fourth. This would be a difference of squares, and we could factor this as conjugates, x squared plus y squared, x squared minus y squared. But the first one would not factor anymore. That would be prime. Sums of, sum of squares is prime. And then x squared minus y squared could actually factor down more as x minus y and x plus y. So that would be our complete factorization of that in algebra. But in trig, we're going to do something very similar. So we are going to think about this as a difference of squares. And we will first factor this as sine squared x plus tangent squared x times sine squared x minus tangent squared x. So initially it factors as those conjugates. But then anything that can be factored down more, we would like to factor it more. The first one is like a sum of squares. That will be prime. So we will not factor that anymore. But we still need to bring it down. And then sine x minus tangent x will be the factorization for the difference of squares. And then that would be sine x plus tangent x. So this now would be the complete look at the factorization of adding and subtracting the fractions when trig functions are involved in algebra.
Anytime that we add or subtract fractions, we have to have a lowest common denominator. So we need these to have the same denominator. Right now we have cotangent theta over 1 plus 1 over cotangent theta. The LCD, when I look at those denominators, would be cotangent theta. And we would need to multiply top and the bottom of the first fraction by cotangent theta. And when we do that, we get cotangent squared theta over cotangent theta. And then we're going to add the second fraction to it. Now that they have the same denominator, we can keep the same denominator and combine the two numerators together on top of our new fraction. So that would be cotangent squared theta plus 1 all over cotangent theta. In part B, it's a little bit more interesting because our denominators are not the same, but they look really, really close. So we have to be careful about how we find an LCD when we have two terms and two terms. LCDs. What would be our LCD? Well, the only way that I can actually change a denominator is by multiplying something in. So our actual LCD, when we look at to see what each of these is missing, this one I would have to multiply in a sine alpha plus 1 times the top and the bottom. And this one I would have to multiply top and the bottom by sine alpha minus 1. So we multiply them basically times each other to find that LCD. So our lowest common denominator would be sine alpha plus 1 times sine alpha minus 1. So those two basically similar to the idea of binomials multiplied together. Now our new fractions would be sine alpha plus 1 divided by that LCD. If I were to multiply these two together, let's go ahead and multiply those together. If I was to multiply those two binomials together, we would get a difference of squares. Foiling, so you could foil, sine squared alpha minus 1. So let's go ahead and foil that together, multiply that, make that look a little bit simpler. So we can foil that. Minus, and then top times the top, we get 1 times sine alpha minus 1 divided by, of course, we multiply these together, get the same denominator, sine squared alpha minus 1. We want to be careful because we are subtracting these two fractions, and this idea will pop up again later on. So you want to be careful that the negative distributes to both terms. So when I combine these fractions together, that's sine alpha plus 1 minus sine alpha, and then plus 1 when I distribute that negative all over sine squared alpha minus 1. So all over that same denominator. Now we want to combine like terms on top of this new fraction. And when we combine like terms, we have sine alpha minus sine alpha, and those end up canceling each other out. And 1 plus 1 is 2. So we get 2 over sine squared alpha minus 1. And this would be our final result as a simplified fraction. Throughout the rest of this chapter, we will run into times when we need to simplify a complex fraction. So let's recall how we simplify a complex fraction. When we have two fractions where one is being divided by the other, so one fraction divided by one fraction, we keep the first fraction the same, we change from division to multiplication, and we flip the second fraction. So that's keep, change, flip. So this would look like 1 over sine theta times, now we're going to flip the second fraction, so that would be times sine theta divided by cosine theta. And we would like to simplify this as much as we can. Well, when I'm multiplying, we can cancel common factors across the two fractions. If one factor is on top and one factor is on the bottom, they can cancel out. And then when I multiply across, now we get 1 over cosine theta.
Now that only works if I do one fraction divided by one fraction. If I have, and if I look at example B, if I have more than one fraction on the top, and here we actually have three separate pieces. We have one, we have sine theta divided by cosine theta, and then we have cosecant theta divided by cosine theta. We actually have three separate pieces. On top we don't just have one fraction, we have more than that. So in order to simplify a complex fraction where I have more than one fraction in the top or more than one fraction in the bottom, we will need to multiply by the LCD of all of our fractions. So when we look at all of our fractions, let's think about this as one over one. We have one, we have cosine theta, and we have cosine theta. So the LCD of all of those little mini fractions would be cosine theta. Once we have our LCD, then we multiply every fraction on the top and the bottom by cosine theta. And you can think about that as like cosine theta over one, if that helps. Because we are now going to simplify each of those multiplications. So in the first part, we have cosine theta times one, well that's just cosine theta. And in the second part, we have sine theta times divided by cosine theta times cosine over one. So our cosine trig functions will cancel each other out. We're left with minus sine theta. So now we have what we call a simple fraction. We do not have any little fractions within the larger fraction. And on the bottom we have the same thing. Cosine thetas cancel each other out. We're left with cosecant theta. So now we would have what we would call a simple fraction. Here we have another complex fraction that we would like to simplify and change that to a simple fraction. Since we have more than one fraction on top, we actually have four different terms, uh, two on the top, two on the bottom. So we can't just flip and multiply. We will actually need to multiply by the LCD. So I need to figure out what is the LCD of all of these little fractions. So let's look at all of the denominators. And we have tangent theta and we have one. So it looks like her LCD would be tangent theta. So we're going to multiply all four of these terms on top and the bottom by tangent theta. Tangent theta on all four. And you can think about that as tangent theta over one if that will help. And then we start to simplify each of those multiplications. So the first term, we multiply that by tangent theta. The tangent thetas will cancel out and we're left with one. So we have one times one over one times one. So we get one. So the first term simplifies to just be one. The second term, nothing cancels out for that multiplication. We just have one times tangent theta. So that would be plus tangent theta. The two terms on top are reducing, uh, we're getting rid of those fractions that were present. Um, in the bottom left, tangent theta and tangent theta will cancel out. We're left with one there again. And on the bottom right, nothing cancels out. We have minus one times tangent theta, so that's minus tangent theta. So here we have our simple, simple fraction, and we're simply using the techniques that we learned in algebra, but we're applying them to the ideas of our trig functions. One really useful technique in trigonometry is to use identities in order to take a complex looking trig expression and change it to be a simpler expression. Here in the last part of this section, we are told to take each expression and write it in terms of sine and cosine. We're going to use identities in order to do that. And we want to simplify so that no quotients appear in the final answer. And when it says that, it simply means we want to write our answer with no fractions. So we want no fractions in our final answer. And we want all of our functions to have an input of, X, of theta only. So, so not negative theta as input, but just positive theta. So let's look at our first example. We have secant theta times cotangent theta times sine theta. 
So we are asked to write each expression first in terms of sine and cosine. So let's look at secant. Uh, secant would be 1 over cosine theta times cotangent. And cotangent would be cosine theta divided by sine theta. So we're using those identities to take what we have and change them into identities that use only sine and cosine. And the last one is sine. That's already written in terms of sine, so we will leave that as it is. Think about that as sine over 1. And I want to get rid of all of my fractions. I don't want to have fractions in my final answer. We see that we could start to cancel across the fractions. We have cosine theta divided by cosine theta. We can cancel those. Sine theta and sine theta can cancel. And what we're left with when we multiply across is just 1 over 1. So our final answer simplifies to be 1. And we can all agree that that is a lot nicer than the expression with those three trig functions that we started out with. Okay, for the next example we have a fraction. And we have cosecant theta divided by cotangent of negative theta. So first, let's use that odd function identity. And let's change cotangent of negative theta to minus cotangent of positive theta. So we're using that identity to replace negative theta with positive theta. So the negative that was on the inside can come on the outside of an odd function. Now let's take what we have and write everything in terms of sine or cosine. So cosecant is the same thing as 1 over sine theta. Cotangent, so let's say negative, that would be negative cosine theta divided by sine theta. We see that we have a complex fraction. We don't want any fractions in our final answer. So I would like to simplify this by flipping the bottom fraction and changing to multiplication. So we'll multiply the top by minus sine theta over cosine theta. Now we can cancel common factors. So sine theta and sine theta will cancel out. So we are left with minus 1 over cosine theta. Now we don't want our final answer to have any fractions in it. So what is an equivalent expression to 1 over cosine theta that does not look like a fraction? Well that would be secant. So I'm going to write this as minus secant theta. All right, in this one we want to simplify. We want to write everything in terms of sine and cosine. We want to get rid of those negative thetas. We want to work with only positive thetas. Now, tangent, we talked about earlier, is an odd function. So we can actually replace tangent of negative theta. We could bring that negative to the outside. We could bring it to the front. So that would be replaced with the negative tangent of positive theta. We do the same thing on the bottom. We're left with the negative tangent theta. So now we've gotten rid of those negative thetas and replaced it with positive thetas. And now let's go through and replace tangent with sine and cosine. So we're going to use that identity, that quotient identity. We have 1 minus sine theta over cosine theta. So we're replacing tangent with that quotient identity. And the same thing on the bottom, we have minus sine theta over cosine theta. So we're asked to replace everything with and write it in terms of just sine and cosine. Now we are asked to write our answers without having any fractions. So once again, we notice that we are simplifying a complex fraction, and we have more than one fraction in the top. So we will need to multiply by the LCD of all of these little fractions within the larger complex fraction, and that would be cosine theta. So we're going to multiply everything, all of the terms, by cosine theta. You can think about that as cosine theta over 1, if that helps. And then we're going to simplify each of those multiplications. Well, the first term, cosine theta times 1, is just cosine theta. 
And here our cosines will cancel out, so we're left with minus sine theta all over, and on the bottom, the cosine will cancel out. So we're left with minus sine theta. Now we were asked to give our, our answer without any fractions in it, so we went from a complex fraction to a simple fraction, but we still have a fraction, and we want to be able to reduce this to just be something that's not a fraction. So we have an important technique that we want to talk about. If I have two terms that are being added and subtracted on top of the same denominator, we can actually separate this into two separate fractions where they each have their own separate denominator. So we're going to give them back, instead of sharing minus sine theta, we're going to give them each their own minus sine theta. Okay, this is going to be helpful and a helpful technique going from one fraction to two separate fractions because now I can use identities to get rid of the fractions. Well, cosine theta divided by minus sine theta, cosine divided by sine would be cotangent, so that would be negative cotangent theta. And anything divided by itself is 1, and we have negative divided by negative, so we end up with a positive 1. So here we have our final answer without any fractions. All right, once again, we would like to take this expression and change everything to be in terms of sine and cosine. So secant theta, we can write that as 1 over cosine theta. Cosecant theta is 1 over sine theta. So there's our first set of parentheses, everything in terms of sine and cosine. And in the second set of parentheses, we already have everything in terms of cosine and sine. Now we'd like to multiply these two parentheses together. So let's think about this as cosine over 1 and sine over 1. And now we're going to FOIL. So first times the first. When I do those fractions, we multiply across the top of both of those fractions. So top times the top and bottom times the bottom. So when I do that, we get 1. So that reduces to 1. Outer times the outer, top times the top, and bottom times the bottom, we get minus sine theta divided by cosine theta. And of course, that is going to be the same thing as tangent theta. Inner times the inner, we get positive cosine theta divided by sine theta. And the identity for that would be cotangent theta. And then last times the last, we get negative sine theta divided by sine theta. So that gives us negative 1. So we have no fractions in our final answer. And we do see that we have some like terms. We have 1 and minus 1, and those can cancel each other out. So we're left with minus tangent theta plus cotangent theta. All right, we want to take secant theta and cosine theta and write in terms of strictly sine and cosine. Secant theta would be 1 over cosine theta. And cosine theta is already, of course, written as cosine theta. And we don't want to have any fractions. We're going to talk about, we talked about earlier, giving them the same denominator. So if I were to subtract these two fractions, the LCD would be cosine theta. So I'm going to multiply top and the bottom by cosine theta. So that gives 1 over cosine theta minus cosine squared theta divided by cosine theta. Now they have the same denominator. We're going to keep the same denominator and combine the numerators on top. So we're going to combine those terms. We're going to talk about a really helpful and useful technique here. And 
we see that we have one when we have when we see one plus or minus a trig function squared one of the things that we want to start to think about is our Pythagorean identities and the Pythagorean identity that talks about cosine in one would be sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to one now we talked about taking our Pythagorean identities and rearranging them in a way that would be convenient. If I would like to replace the top of this fraction, one minus cosine squared theta, if I would like to take this and replace it with something that's simpler, but it's equivalent to that, what we can do is I can take my Pythagorean identity and I could rearrange it. Let's get one side to look like this, one minus cosine squared theta. So if I take my Pythagorean identity and I subtract cosine squared theta from both sides, then we end up with an equivalent form of that Pythagorean identity. Sine squared theta is equal to one minus cosine squared theta. So if this is equivalent to sine squared theta, then I'm gonna replace one minus cosine squared theta in the fraction with sine squared theta over cosine theta. So we can do that replacement. It actually makes my fraction look a lot simpler than it did before. Now that I've done this replacement, I still don't want to have fractions in my final answer. So we're going to take care of that by thinking about sine squared theta as sine theta times sine theta. So let's separate it here. And let's write that as all over cosine theta. And if I write the top as sine theta times sine theta over cosine theta, if you think about it, this really is the same exact thing as sine theta over cosine theta times sine theta over one. If I multiply these fractions back together, top times the top, I get sine theta times sine theta, and bottom times the bottom, we get cosine theta. So this is one of the things we want to start to practice, the ideas of taking one fraction and being able to separate it into two, and taking two fractions and being able to combine it into one. So these are techniques that we're going to start to use throughout the rest of this chapter. Now how is this helpful to separate it from one fraction to two? Well, <clears throat> sine theta over cosine theta, that's the same thing as tangent theta. And now I have tangent theta, I have no fraction there, and then sine theta, well we could just say multiply by sine theta. So our final answer here, without any fractions in it, would be tangent theta times sine theta. All right, so our, our last example. Um, we are asked to take each one of these functions and write them in terms of sine and cosine. So sine is already in terms of sine. Cosecant should be written as one over sine theta minus sine theta. And we're gonna think about that as over one. And we have this sine theta, we're gonna distribute the sine theta into the parentheses. So when we do that, we get sine theta divided by sine theta minus, and we have sine theta times a negative sine theta. So that's minus sine squared theta. Sine divided by sine, of course, is one, and one minus sine squared theta. And let's practice with that idea that we just talked about, um, and that would be using a Pythagorean identity as a replacement to make what we see similar. So we have a Pythagorean identity that involves one and sine squared, and that would be sine squared theta 
plus cosine squared theta is equal to one. And I would like to rearrange this Pythagorean identity so that I see one minus sine squared theta. So in order to get that, I'm gonna subtract sine squared theta from both sides of that identity. And we are left with cosine squared theta is equal to one minus sine squared theta. So we have an equivalency. Cosine squared theta is exactly the same thing as one minus cosine squared theta. So we're gonna replace one minus sine squared theta with its equivalent cosine squared theta. And that is the simplest that this problem could get.